I come to you in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Good morning, Trinity Church. Good to be with you. For those who are joining us via the live stream, welcome, and we're so glad you're joining us as well. We're in the second week of our three-week sort of series on living into our values. Last week, Kara preached wonderfully and powerfully on love. This week, I will preach on community. And next week, uh, Joanna will be up to speak about compassion. So today, we're going to talk about community. And what's different about community as being at the church. Because we are different. This is a different thing. Community. In the New Testament, they speak of koinonia. They speak of fellowship. They speak of having common, holding in common. This word koinonia was used over 20 times in the New Testament to talk about these communities, these fellowships of followers of Jesus Christ. They gathered together, holding the faith together, being held together by God's love. This, this idea of koinonia. So we're going to talk about community. Because this is different than being part. This is not called Trinity Club. This is not called Trinity Social Action Committee, whatever it is. This is not a gathering because we all like antique cars. This is not a gathering because we all like to go like watch birds. This isn't a gathering because we all play bridge or we all play golf. We are not a club. This is now no offense choir. We are, we are not the like mutual admiration society of choral music, though we love you. We're not the group of Anglophiles that long to live in England or whatever it is. And for me to have a different kind of accent, one being not from Kentucky. We are not the Institute for Advanced Theological Studies. We are not a mission. We are not arm in arm. We are the church. We are a community of faith. We are a community of followers of Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't do those things. It doesn't mean that those aren't a part of our identity, but they are not our identity. Our identity is to be followers of Jesus Christ. Our identity, that which holds us together, is this thing right here, which is the story. Our story, God's story for God and God's people. Now, I'm in some kind of participatory thing. Last sermon, I gave you money. I'm not giving you money this week. Uh, but I did ask you to hold the money while I talk to you. So there's Bibles in the pews. Take the Bible and hold it. This is our story. This is our story. This informs us. Now, for some of you, it may have been the first time you've held a Bible in some time. Because we're Episcopalians. The little thing in the leaflet is enough. Whatever it is. This is the Bible. So this story is the story of God and God's people. This story is as big as the universe. And it's also intimately personal. And speaks to each and every one of us. It is huge and it's intimate. It's amazing. It's a story that transcends time. In this story, we are introduced in our faith to the God of the Creator, the Creator of the universe. In this story, the one named Jesus, whom we call our Savior, is revealed to us. In a story of the life and death and resurrection, and what that means is revealed to us. This story is a story of the proclamation of good news that we proclaim to the world. This story has been around for thousands of years and transcends time and space and people and cultures and all of our lives. And in the vastness of this story, we can also find ourselves and find the divine and find hope and find challenge and find a way forward. Now, this book is an imperfect book. I'm Episcopalian, we can say that. If I were Baptist, they might have already thrown a rock at me. But that's why I was raised. But anyway, this book is imperfect. This book has been used for wonderful, loving, loving things. This book has been also used as a vehicle to do horrible, horrible, horrible things. And horrible things have been done in the name of this book and to what this book supposedly points to, which I don't believe it does. This book can be a mixed bag, but it's our book. Because we're a mixed bag too. It's our book, and there's truth in the story. 
And then we live out as a people of this story, of this sacred story and our story intimately intertwined. And we live it out bound in these baptismal waters. Those baptismal waters and the sealing when we say you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and baptism. And you, dear one, are marked as Christ's own forever. This story tells us that we are Christ's own, God's own, God's beloved forever, forever, forever. That's wonderful. That's the grounding of us. And then we find nourishment on the way each and every Sunday gathered at this table, a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. And what do we say each Sunday? At this table there are no outcasts, no strangers, no unwanted guests. All are welcome to feast at the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. So please, dear one, come and be fed. Come and be fed. And may your hunger be fed. May your longing be fed. May your brokenness be healed. May you find your way forward. May you find courage. May you find a way. Because this crazy imperfect story is a holy sacred story that's our story for an imperfect people. But a loving God. Bound together in baptism and nourished in the sacraments. And all are welcome as we find our way forward. That is different than being part of a bridge group. And that's different than being part of a wine club or a bird watching club or a country club. Number one, that's our identity. Number two, Henry Nouwen says that there is nothing sweet nor easy about being part of Christian community. You might say, well, that doesn't sound very nice. It's true. There is nothing sweet or easy about being part of Christian community. Why might that be? Well, because we're part of the Christian community, and we are often not sweet nor easy, because we're human, human beings. So there's nothing sweet nor easy about the Christian community. It takes work. And he says why it's not sweet nor easy is because in it, because we imperfect birds come, he says, with truth. We come with truth in a world that often wants to hide the truth, candy coat the truth, cover the truth, spin the truth. We come here with the truth and say, this is me. And I'm one squirrely bird. And I'm trying to catch my breath and keep my head above water. I'm trying to find my way home. We come here, and it's not sweet and easy, because we say we bring the truth here, the truth of us and the truth of the world. And most people would rather have diversion, distractions, illusion, or fantasy to escape it. We do not come here to escape the world. We come here to learn the truth of the gospel, the truth of ourselves, and a truth to help transform the world. Thomas Merton says it another way. He says the Christian community is supposed to be real. Real life, real people, real struggles, real dreams, real tears, real laughter. Always real. And the reality is of that, I believe, is that we know, we need to know, as we live in our faith, that the truth and reality here, now listen to me this, is more real than the truth out there. The reality out there. Our love, the love of God, is more real than the hate we have for one another. Our joy that we find in Christ is more real than the despair that weighs down our hearts. Our promise of new life in God, of resurrected life, our promise of life is more real. More real than the death that beats us down. And there's a whole world that thinks that's the reality and that's the truth. But we say here, this is so real. And this is so true. Because there is a love that overtakes every hate. There is a joy that heals every despair. There is a life that lets us find our way through the, through the power of death. We have that reality, that truth in this place. 
And sometimes it is not sweet and is not nice, but it is hard. Merton also says that whenever we come in here, we need to be informed by the reality. We need to ask ourselves these three questions. What did Christ come for? What did, the, what did death on the cross mean? And what was God's ultimate aim and purpose in this whole thing? What did Christ come for? What did he die for? What is God's ultimate purpose and aim in this whole story? That should always inform us in the reality that shapes this community. Okay. Now to let you know, I had a total of five points to this sermon, but I've lovingly and compassionately cut it to three. Because <laughs> I knew once I got rolling, each point would take longer, twice as long as I thought. Here's the third point. Henry Allen also says that the Christian community can be seen or thought of as a mosaic. Okay? You've seen mosaics, what are wonderful pieces of art, and you stand back from a distance and you look at this mosaic and there's this beautiful picture that the artist has created, this beautiful image and beautiful colors that catch your eye. And this story is being told and you look at it and then you get closer and closer and closer and you realize what the mosaic is what? 10,000 little pieces. And most of the time the pieces are not cut in some precise way, but the pieces are broken fragments of something else. They are very imperfect in their shape, broken in their shape, maybe chinked in their, in their shape, scratched or dulled, whatever, and of all kinds of textures and all kinds of materials and all kinds of minerals. And the artist takes all of these in their uniqueness and in their beauty, in their brokenness and in their reality. And the artist takes them and makes something beautiful. Beautiful. That's what you are. That's what we are. So I was, <laughs> excuse me, I was walking in rummage and I walked by and saw a puzzle there. So I took it. I told Margo I took it. I didn't want to be accused of stealing from the rummage. I took it, and this is the puzzle right here. It's called Living Waters. I don't have a mosaic, but I've got a puzzle here. Because part of being Christian community is to go that each of us are a piece of God's amazing, beautiful mosaic of creation. That God takes each of us in our brokenness, in our imperfections, with the, brilliant, with the brilliance of our colors and the scars of our reality. God takes each of us and said, Dear one, this mosaic of my creation, this story of my creation, I've been working on since the beginning of time. And you, you are a special and intimate and needed part in my story. So each of us, each of us is part of this community or an intimate part of God's creative act in restoring and redeeming our world and bringing life. In our imperfections, in our brokenness, but also in our brilliance and in our beauty. And God takes us and says, oh, Julie, don't you know? Your color, your brilliance, and your brokenness is exactly what I needed right and since the beginning of time, I've planned this wonderful work. And right here, dear one, I want you. Right here. And Jim and Tara and Spencer and Hank and all of us, we look. And God says, you, dear one, my beloved one, in your brilliance, in your beauty, in your brokenness, are part of my wonderful mosaic of creation. And I will work on it to the very end. So what I want you to do this day is to remember that being part of this community is to realize the brilliance of you. The brilliance of you. The beauty of you. The radiance of you. Even the imperfection of you. And God takes it and says, oh, how beautiful. Right here is where I call you and where I need you. So I want all of you to take a puzzle piece when you come to Eucharist or when you go home, there's more. Take, there's, I got plenty. It was a big puzzle. <laughs> Take plenty. And I want you to remember that you are here for a reason. The truth of your life, the reality of life, it hurts and it's hard. And sometimes it's not sweet nor easy. 
But we come here with the truth, bound in God's love, to be part of the wonderful, creative, active, and loving God, revealing God's story of redemption. And God will continue that story until every single piece of the glorious mosaic is in place. God will not stop. Because when we leave this place today, there's going to be a lot of puzzle pieces left. Our job is not done until the very last piece. God picks up and says, oh, dear beloved one, I've been chasing you your whole cotton-picking life, but you're a fast little burger, hard to catch. But I've been with you all the way. Now, dear one, do you know that you are a beloved, wonderful, brilliant piece of my mosaic? I've known you since before you were born. I know you after your last breath, and I'll hold you always in my heart. Now, dear one, this is you, your mind, and an integral part of my work of wonderful creation and art. And then one glorious day, I pray God will put the last piece in that mosaic and say, man, well done, well done. Let's feast, beloved people. Let's feast. Because all of my children have found their way home. And all of my children know of their brilliance and beauty. And my wonderful, loving act of art and creation, all of my children have found their way now. So until then, we keep working as this beloved community to share that beloved story that everyone knows they're part of this wonderful, creative, loving act of God. So find your peace. Know your place. You are an intimate and important part of God's act of creation and of this place, Trinity Church. So forward in faith we go, beloved ones, in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, amen.